be looking at that whole chapter tonight. And you go, if you find the big book of Ezekiel there in the Old Testament, it's a rather lengthy book. So if you can find Ezekiel, just thumb on over a few more pages and you'll come to Daniel. And uh, that's one of the good things about having a real paper Bible. You know, you'll, uh, you'll get more familiar with where the books are located. Um, but I guess putting the verses on the screens at time to time is a good thing too. It keeps you from having to use up time during the message to try to find the scripture, especially if it's a hard to find one. But it's good to go ahead and learn where the books of the Bible are. How many of you learned the books of the Bible in order when you were in Sunday school, maybe as a kid? How many did that? All right, several, several, yeah. That's, uh, that's always helpful. And most of that won't leave you. You'll, uh, you might forget one once in a while if it's been a lot of years. But you go through them again a time or two, and they'll come right back to you. It's like, like riding a bicycle. You don't ever forget how. Amen. All right, Daniel chapter number 6. This is the famous story. And the kids are like this. They hear this story every once in a while. Kids, this is about Daniel in the lion's den. And we like lion's dens, don't we? No, we don't like lion's dens. <laughs> I was tricking you. <laughs> we, uh, we're scared of lions, tigers, and things like that. <laughs> but this is the story of Daniel in the lion's den. We'll, we'll read a few verses, maybe not the whole chapter. Let's begin in verse number 1 of chapter 6. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 princes, which should be over the whole kingdom, and over against these three presidents, of whom Daniel was first, the princes, that the princes might give accounts to them, and the king should have no damage. Then this Daniel was preferred above the presidents and princes because he had, underline these next two words, an excellent spirit. Excellent spirit. I admire an excellent spirit in people, don't you? Somebody's just... A good attitude goes a long ways. You kind of like to be around people that's got a good attitude, but an excellent spirit goes even beyond that. He was preferred all, above all the presidents presidents and princes because of an excellent spirit was in him and the king thought to set him over the whole realm well these guys got jealous of him verse number four then the presidents and the princes sought to find an occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom but they could find an occasion nor fault for as much as he was faithful underline that word faithful you know there are a lot of things we can't be but as Dr. Lee Robertson said a lot of times you might not be a lot of things, but you can be faithful. As much as he was faithful, neither was there any error or fault found in him. Then said these men, we shall not find any occasion against Daniel, except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. Then these presidents and princes assembled together to the king and said thus unto him, O king, Darius live forever. All the presidents of the kingdom, the governors and the princes and the counselors and the captains have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make, firm, make a firm decree that whosoever shall ask a petition of any god or man for 30 days, save of thee, O king, he shall be cast into the den of lions. Now let's stop right there just for a moment. So you see there was jealousy and envy there, the the uh, comrades of Daniel there in the government, they didn't like him because he served God. And so they're trying to trick the king through flattery. And you've got to watch people who will flatter you, right? And so they flattered the king and said, boy, we just need to make up a law, king, so nobody can pray to anybody, any God or any person, except for you, king, for 30 days. Well, that sounded good to the king because he was stricken with flattery. He liked that. A lot of us do, don't we? but it's not a very good thing to be stricken with. Well, he went ahead and made the law, and according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, of which he was the king, when the king made a law, it couldn't be changed. It had to be carried out. And so they, they knew Daniel would be praying in his window towards Jerusalem three times a day, as he always had. And so they caught him praying, and they took him to the king, and they said, Now, king, you, made, you signed a law, that said nobody could pray to anybody, any king, except for you for 30 days. Well, we caught Daniel praying to his God. Now, what are you going to do about it, king? You signed the law. The king said, well, yeah, the law of Medes and Persians can't be changed. I guess you got me there. So he sent and had Daniel thrown in the lion's den. And 
it says in verse number 17, And a stone was brought and laid upon the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet and with the signet of his lord's, that the purpose might not be changed concerning Daniel. Then the king went into his palace and passed the night fasting. Neither were instruments of music brought before him, and his sleep went from him. He, he really liked Daniel. He couldn't sleep. He didn't want to have any food. He didn't want to have any music, nothing. He's just fasting. <clears throat> Verse 19, Then the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste to the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried with a lamentable voice and said unto Daniel, and the king spake and said to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, is thy God, whom thou servest continually, able to deliver thee from the lions? Then said Daniel unto the king, O king, live forever. My God hath sent his angel, underline that word, angel. God sends, sends helpers. Sometimes the angel in the scripture is the angel of the Lord, speaking specifically of Jesus Christ. Sometimes it's another angel. But he says, My God has sent his angel and has shut the lions' mouths that they have not hurt me. For as much as before him innocency was found in me, and also before thee, O king, have I done no hurt. Then was the king exceeding glad for him and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no manner of hurt was found upon him because he believed in his God. Let's pray right there. Father, we pray that you'd bless us tonight. Help us to learn from this passage of Scripture. Lord, let us not just pass it off as a children's story, but it's the infallible Word of God, and it has value for us to learn how to live for you and to face things like lion's dens. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So Daniel gets thrown in the lion's den. The king says to him when he gets thrown in, he said, Don't worry, Daniel. That God of yours is going to keep you safe. And he's got his fingers crossed. <laughs> and next, he didn't really believe that much. Or the next morning he wouldn't say, Oh, Daniel, was I God able to deliver you? He would have known already if he really believed it. So we're preaching tonight on, on surviving lion's dens. Surviving the lion's den. A godly life got Daniel thrown in the lion's den. A godly life caused Daniel to face circumstances that could have cost him his life, but he chose to do that. How did Daniel go about keeping his sanity? We don't see Daniel crying and say, Oh, please, king, don't throw me in the lion's den. Oh, please, God, oh, deliver me. Don't throw me in the lion's den. You don't find Daniel saying that. He just marches right into the lion's den. And he lays down there all night long. Evidently, he's a... Uh, First one to have a recliner with a vibrating headboard on it, and he just tickled the old cats under the chin, and they purred and put him to sleep. Everybody's worried about Daniel except Daniel and God. <laughs> and so Daniel, Daniel gets out the next morning, and, and uh, he's pretty happy about the whole thing. He doesn't seem to be worried at all. Wasn't worried when he got thrown in there, and he wasn't, he wasn't surprised when he got out like the king was. This chapter in Daniel concludes the strictly historical part of the account of, of the book of Daniel. And this story is somewhat illustrative of the remnant that will be left of God's people during the tribulation time. They'll face great danger, but God will be the one who will deliver them. King Darius was set over the city of Babylon. Cyrus was the king over the whole realm. And so Darius was sort of the mayor of the city, I guess you'd say. And Daniel worked for him. And these political adversaries got mad at him and devised a way they thought would do him in. However, after it failed, they got thrown into the lion's den and the lions weren't too happy about those guys and they ate them up. Darius loved Daniel, but he couldn't, or he couldn't change the order and law of the Medes and the Persians. So Daniel spent a night of tranquility in there with those lions. And the king is astonished the next day. Sometimes you and I face things that's similar to a lion's den. Somebody said a smooth sea never produces a good sailor. And that's why I guess God kind of stirs up our seas once in a while and 
God allows us to be thrown into a lion's den sometimes, but I, I believe that there will be situations coming up in the near future. And this is just opinion. I believe that as we approach the end of the end times, as we get closer and closer to the time when the Antichrist will be revealed, as we approach that horrible seven-year period known as the tribulation, I think things will continually get worse and we see the world turning upside down right now. Everything has gone crazy. People don't make sense. People, you could, used, used to you could find even your adversaries would have some form of logic. Now logic goes nowhere. Nobody cares. Nobody cares about facts, data, and, feel, and that, all they care about is feeling. And so we're headed into a time where the Antichrist will be accepted because he'll offer something that the people who love emotions will be attracted to. And when that happens, people who are faithful to God, people who have been saved by the grace of God and trying to live a life separated from the world and in line with the word of God, those people will be hated. Now, I don't mean to discourage you, but as we come closer to the end times, people in general are not going to like you as much. And it's beginning to show already Christians are being targeted more than any other group when it comes to some sort of issue with religion. Muslims tend to get away with things and nobody questions them. Muslims can hate the homosexuals and nobody says a word about that. But if a Christian ever says a derogatory remark about homosexuality, they get roasted. We might be looking at some lion dens in the future. But my purpose is not to instill fear into you tonight. My purpose is to encourage you to live for God. And when Daniel lived for God and when he said, as fearful as that den of lions may be, I will face it joyfully because there is a God in heaven and that God is able to take care of me. And as the three Hebrew children that were thrown into the, ferny, the burning fiery furnace, they said, King, we're not careful to answer thee. We're not going to worship the false idols. And you can cast us into the fire if you want to. We're not going to worship your false idols. We believe God will deliver us. But if not, <laughs> I like that part. But if not, we're still not going to worship your idols. Boy, we need some we need some old-fashioned Christians today who are just willing to stick by the stuff, quit playing the world's game, quit acknowledging all of that is, that is ungodly and wicked and evil and just say, I'm standing with God. I'm standing on the Word of God and things may get rough, but I'm still standing with God. Come hell or high water, come lion's dens or come fiery furnaces, I'm still going to stand with God. So how shall we get ready for this possible lion's den that we may end up facing. How shall we get ready? Well, number one, be committed to the Lord's will. In Daniel 6, verse 16, it says there, the king commanded and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. Now the king spake and said unto Daniel, thy God whom thou servest, what's the next word? Continually, he will deliver thee. There's something they knew about Daniel. They knew that he served God and that he didn't just serve him once in a while. He wasn't a Christmas and Easter only kind of Christian. He was the kind of Christian that loved God seven days a week, all through the month, through the 12 months of the year. He just loved God and everybody knew it. The king said, that God you serve continually, continually, the one you've patterned your life after, he's going to be able to take care of you, Daniel. So let's look at some things. What does it take to be committed? If we're going to face a lion's den, you don't want to go kicking and screaming. You know, like one guy said, he said, when I die, I want to die peacefully. I want to die peacefully in my sleep like my grandfather. Not like the people in the back seat of his car who were screaming. <laughs> well, if you want to face the lion's den peacefully, that's the key word, peacefully, not kicking and screaming and fearful, then there's something we need to do. What do we do? First of all, commitment must be complete. You remember the song? I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. And then 
No turning back. No turning back. That's commitment. Commitment that is complete. Not just surface commitment, but it goes all the way to the heart. 1 Corinthians 10, 31 says, Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. That sounds like somebody is just sold out like the Apostle Paul. He's sold out lock, stock, and barrel, and he's saying whatever you do, it doesn't matter what you do, but whatever you do, you ought to do it to the glory of God. Be sold out 100%. Com commitment must be complete. Commitment must be continual. The king said, this God you serve, Daniel, he's the God you serve continually. Man, continual service. I love to see people sitting in the church house who just, they show up every service. Boy, it's just, it's encouraging to a preacher. It's encouraging to other Christians to see people who just show up continually, continually. It's wonderful to hear people talk about witnessing to people and they're just continual about it. Every time they get a chance, they talk to somebody about the Lord. Continual. Commitment has to be continual. People who just pray and seek the Lord's face and try to walk with the Lord, they do it continually. Boy, that's commitment. Continual. And then real commitment must be controlled. Controlled. Curtis Hudson said, surrender is when you sign a blank sheet of paper and hand it to God for Him to fill in the details. Commitment means allowing God to be in control of your life. Commitment must be controlled. Not controlled by me. Controlled by Him. In Psalm 37, 5, it says, commit, commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also in Him, and He shall bring it to pass. Just trust in the Lord. Hey, Daniel, they're going to throw you in the lion's den. I'm just following the Lord. If the Lord leads into the lion's den, that's where I'll be. Huh? Yeah. Wherever He leads, I will follow. Real commitment must be concrete. There needs to be something besides just some harebrained idea that we hang our hat on, and that's the Word of God. Somebody's going to be really committed. They're going to believe the promises of God. And that's why they're going to go into that lion's den with confidence, assurance, faith, because they've read the Word of God and they know the promises. All the promises of God are yea and amen in Him. God keeps His Word. Real commitment must be concrete. Second Peter 1.19 says, We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. We have a more sure word of prophecy. There's people, there's movies, Hollywood movies, that talks about the end times. and I don't know where they get that idea unless they got it out of here in the first place, but they didn't get it accurately. We have the more sure word of prophecy. And that's why we can face the lion's den with courage. So commitment to God and His will, commitment to God's will is the first step to facing a lion's den with peace and tranquility. So then what? After commitment? Well... Have strong faith in God's goodness. Have faith in God's goodness. God doesn't play with His people, His children, like a cat plays with a mouse before He kills them. God is not a capricious God. God's a loving God. God loves His children and He cares for them. The world says, show me and I'll follow you. God says, Follow me and I'll show you. That's faith. Have faith in God's goodness. In verse number 23 of our text, it says, The king, then was the king exceeding glad for him and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no manner of hurt was found upon him. Watch this. Because he believed in his God. He believed. In, what is that? That's faith. That's faith that his God was going to take care of him. Have faith that God is a good God. How do we do that? Well, the calm assurance in the lion's den comes after we have a strong faith in the 
goodness of God no matter what happens. Um, sometimes we put, we put a what if before we follow him, before we believe he's going to take care of us. What if? Well, what if this happens? Well, what if it does? God's good. What if this happens? Well, what if it does? God's going to care for you and he's going to take care of you. So calm assurance in the lion's den comes with a strong faith in God's goodness regardless of the possible danger. Was this man, Daniel, facing danger? He knew that law had been made. The Bible says it in our text. He knew that those guys were trying to trap him and cause him to end up breaking the new law of the Medes and Persians so that he would end up in the lion's den. And he knew that. And yet he went to his window and opened them and prayed just like always. Was there danger? Yeah, and he knew it. Is there danger in things that we face from time to time? We may face a hospital stay. We may face death. We may face financial ruin. We may face family problems. But whatever danger we face, we face isn't God still good? Doesn't God still love His children? Will God not take care of His own? Regardless of the possible danger, step out, have a backbone, and go right on in where He sends you. Where He leads, I will follow. Regardless of the possible danger. And regardless of the possible reward. Some people will serve God if there's something they can get out of it. Not Daniel. He said, this is kind of a lose-lose situation except I love God. I'm not going to get anything out. Now, did he get rewarded after it was all over? Yeah, if you read the rest of it, it says that he set old Daniel up it says in verse number 28, the last verse of chapter 6, so this, so this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. He got rewarded. But he didn't know he was going to get rewarded. All he knew was he's going to be thrown into the lion's den and probably get eaten. And so he didn't, he didn't fear the danger and he didn't go in just based on what kind of reward he might get out of it. He, he wasn't like the guy that there was this big Texan, big rich Texan who had a coming out party for his daughter. He wanted his daughter to meet all the eligible bachelors in the land and so he invited everybody over to a pool party in his backyard. And so as they're having the party, the old rich rancher got up and said, let me have everybody's attention. He said, I want to offer my daughter's hand in marriage. And he said... Uh, this pool is full of alligators. He said, the man that will jump in that pool full of alligators and swim all the way to the other end, he said, I will give you 1,000 acres of prime Texas ranch land or I'll give you $10 million just in cash or I'll give you my daughter's hand in marriage. And so... Boy, about the time he said that, there's a splash in the pool. Man, somebody's flopping and wailing his feet and legs around, <laughs> hands in that pool. Finally, a young man drenched to the bone crawls out at the other end, unhurt by them alligators. And the old rancher said, man, I am amazed at this. He said, you have done above my expectations. He said, would you like my daughter's hand in marriage? He said, no, sir. He said, do you want the $10 million? He said, no, sir. He said, then I assume you want the, the land that I promised. The young man said, no, sir. He said, well, good night, man. What do you want? He said, I want to know the name of that dude that pushed me in the swimming pool. <laughs> Reward. Daniel went into the lion's den with full knowledge that he could be eaten, but he went, and he didn't cry and moan and bellyache. He went with faith. In God. You know, being rich may have its advantages. I've never tried it yet. Well, I tried it, just didn't make it. I uh, heard one guy said, I want to be a billionaire just like my Uncle Harry. He said, your Uncle Harry is a billionaire? He said, no, he just wants to be, a, he wants to be one, though. 
I've heard poor people saying, I'm satisfied with Jesus, but I've never heard a rich man saying, I'm satisfied with my money. Daniel was a man who knew his greatest wealth was in the Lord. Charles Spurgeon tells a little boy, and we read, we read back there at the beginning of our text where it says, you remember where it says that uh, Darius had chosen Daniel because of his excellent spirit? Charles Spurgeon told about the little boy who was reading Daniel chapter 6, and he made a mistake. He misread a word. He said, Then this Daniel was preferred above all the presidents and princes because he had an excellent spine. <laughs> he mispronounced spirit. You know, as Spurgeon said, that might have been poor reading, but it's good theology. He, Daniel had a spine. He was willing to stand up for his God. Daniel knew God cared for him. And God cares for you. When you face the lion's den, God cares for you. 1 Peter 5, 7 says, Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Oh, there's so many times we face problems and like Peter, sometimes we're a little bit maybe hesitant to let everybody know that we're a Christian and stand up for God. Because what might happen? Later Peter said, He careth for you. Peter learned firsthand how much God cared for him. Daniel knew that God cared for him and that's why he wasn't afraid to walk into that lion's den. He said to himself, he probably said, You know, I don't know what awaits me at the bottom of that lion's den. But whatever happens, I know God loves me and I trust Him. I trust Him. It says in Daniel 6.22, My God has sent His angel and hath shut the lion's mouths that they have not hurt me. For as much as before Him innocency was found in me, and also before Thee, O King, I have done no hurt. He said, I wasn't afraid to step in there. And the reason I got out is because God sent His angel to shut the mouths of the lions. God can do that, you know. Pastor Don Whitney and his wife had an unusual experience on their wedding night. He says they were married in Fayetteville, Arkansas, and it was snowing when the wedding was over, and they had a they had a uh, an inn where they were supposed to spend the night over in Oklahoma, and so they got in their vehicle and started driving. And they said, "Boy, immediately they didn't they didn't know they were driving into the jaws of an 18 inch blizzard." They said, boy, the roads were covered. They're driving little back roads, little two-lane roads. The road was getting deeper and deeper. And the cars that had already gone through, their tire marks had already been erased, obscured, obliterated by that heavy falling blizzard. And they said they were just, all they could do was just try to see where the weeds were on the side of the road and try to go between the weeds and hope they were on the highway. He said they drove and they drove and they drove and and the snow was getting deeper and they're in the middle of nowhere and they're driving and, and it's getting kind of scary. And finally, they agreed that this is going to be treacherous. We could die out here. And so they decided the next farmhouse we come to, we'll stop and ask them if we can stay all night with them. Even knowing this is their wedding night and they're going to possibly have to spend their wedding night and maybe their whole honeymoon in the house of a stranger. And, but they decided they'd do that. So finally they stopped at the next house they saw nobody was home they got back in their car and started down the road even further driving further into the unknown territory in that blizzard they found another house and same thing nobody was home and they drove on down the road and as they were contemplating what's going to happen to them they said he looked up in the rear view mirror and saw a pair of headlights coming up from behind and he said this old pickup pulled out in the left lane even though we're on a little old country road covered with snow that little pickup pulled around them and got in front of them and slowed down and kind of cruised along the same speed they were <coughs> they said they followed that pickup because he was leaving tracks in the snow and they didn't know where else to go and so they followed him he'd turn this way and he'd turn that way and he'd get on some little country roads that's even smaller and they followed him because they didn't know what else to do and they said after they'd just given up hope, had no idea what was going to happen, they said that pickup turned down one more road and it stopped. 
and his lights were shining ahead, and I could see right over the arch of the road was an archway that was the very resort that they were headed to to spend the night. They said as they looked at that, their hearts was gladdened, and that old pickup turned around and drove back down the road and out of sight, and they never saw him again. Never knew who it was, why it passed them and led them along the way and ended up right there where they were supposed to be for that night and then disappeared. Jim said, I can't prove to you that that was an angel, but you can't convince me it wasn't. (laughs) God has a way of looking out for his own and he has a way of looking out for you. You may face some terrible circumstances. You may try to stand for God and be resented for it. And you may face some difficult times, and your family might, in the days to come. But we can face it fearlessly because there is a God in heaven who cares for his children. Let's pray together. Father, we love you and thank you for your great, great love. Lord, we know you care for us. We know you lead us. Lord, we're just convinced in our heart that you led Daniel right into that lion's den because you knew what you were going to do when you got him in there. You knew you were going to bring him right on out after a tranquil night of sleep. Lord, we go into so many areas where we don't know what lies ahead of us. But Lord, help us, strengthen us to stand for you no matter what. Lord, please help us to have faith that you care for us and you love us and you're going to guide us no matter what. Help us to have the courage and the faith just to stand. Lord, I pray if there's someone who's not saved tonight in this room or watching on the internet, Lord, I pray that tonight they'd say, I know I'm a sinner and I believe Jesus died to pay for my sins. I want to accept him tonight and be saved. Lord, I pray you'd help them to have faith to do that. Lord, if there's Christians who have been facing dire circumstances and don't know what they're going to do, Lord, I pray that you'd give them faith, courage, and commitment like you gave to Daniel. Lord, I pray you'd bless us tonight in this invitation. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. If you need to come and pray, you're welcome. If you need to be saved, we'll have somebody show you how to be saved tonight. If you're watching on the web and you don't know what to do to be saved, send us an email, give us a message, post on our website, comment, let us know that you need help, and we'll help you. We'll show you the scripture that can tell you how to be saved. Christian, God loves you. He didn't bring you this far to dump you in the wilderness. He didn't bring you this far to let you get eaten by the lions. He means to be with you all the way. He loves you.